I'm here with Scott McGill, the CIO of Coriel uh, Institute. Uh, you do some fantastic, uh, incredibly complex work with uh, ge genetic modeling and, uh, and uh, bioengineering. Can you describe what the Institute does? Sure. Yeah, so Coriel Institute is a 50-year-old uh, nonprofit uh, organization in Camden, New Jersey. And uh, we've been, for uh, the majority of the company's history, a biobank, which means that we store biomedical specimens that we provide to research institutes, um, about four and a half million specimens in total, um, that are highly characterized and highly classified for um, research in specific disease areas. But in the last three or four years, the focus of the Institute has really shifted to genetic uh, research as it relates to personalized medicine. So there is uh, an awful lot of scientific evidence that suggests that your genetic makeup can make you predisposed to certain complex conditions like diabetes or coronary artery disease, uh, prostate cancer, things like that, um, as well as whether or not certain medications will respond for you individually. So in the past, when your doctor has prescribed certain medicines for you, it's really been a trial and error uh, type of, of uh, endeavor. But it's, uh, it's now much more scientifically valid to do a genetic test and to see whether or not um, your genetics will have an impact on whether or not your body can metabolize that medicine. So we've been running a study for the past three years called the Coriel Personalized Medicine Collaborative that has enrolled um, several different cohorts of people into a genetic uh, study that is a longitudinal um, uh, uh, participatory study that invites people to view results from a genetic test, a DNA test that we do within the, our, our CLIA certified lab, and uh, see the results of that as it relates to their uh, genetic makeup, their family history, their lifestyle, um, and to help to inform their physicians for what care to, to actually prescribe for those people. So that study has uh, blossomed to a point where, um, because of just the sheer magnitude of the data that, that we store, um, each participant is about two million points of data or, or about a gigabyte of information. Um, we find ourselves uh, in a, an incredible overload of data that uh, really needs to be analyzed and needs to be stored and cared for in a way um, that can really produce the best outcomes. So um, we turn to IBM and, uh, and have brought in some, uh, some significant technology investments from the IBM uh, both service monitoring stack, their uh, web catalog capabilities, business process management, and storage platforms uh, to really help to reinvent the infrastructure of Corio. And what have been the biggest payoffs of you know, getting some uh, analytical discipline around all this data? So we're really just starting to see the value of, of uh, analyzing the data in and of itself. We've, we've been able to return some really rather valuable risk results to people by way of uh, some pretty manual processes, the curation of scientific information as it's been published. And um, what we've been able to do uh, with that information is really provide people with an interactive portal that allows them to um, see any particular uh, risk that we report back and their specific uh, genetic makeup as it relates to that risk. But in the future, what we know will happen is uh, this will move away from the, the wet science in the laboratories and more toward um, data correlation of full genome sequencing. So we today return about 2 million points of data with a targeted chip-based gene array technology. But the cost of full genome sequencing has uh, just skyrocketed down in the last uh, three to five years. Um, to the point now where it is um, quite, quite honestly affordable. It's become sub $5,000, and we see that going sub $1,000 to get your entire genome uh, sequenced within the next three to five years. So um, now that, that opens up a, a whole new field of discovery, and it's all IT analytics. It's all data analytics at that point. It's not about what can we discover in the laboratory. It's about what can we um, determine about someone based on the information that we've collected. So now that you see the cost of sequencing the genome becoming essentially a consumer commodity, uh, how is that going? To, how do you think that's going to change uh, the nature of your work? Well, significantly, the um, you know the amount of data that's produced is um, just so unknown right now. That, you know, only a small fraction of the uh, the full genome has really been studied to this point. So new discoveries are coming out literally every week of new things, new correlations. Um, that can be made about uh, particular genetic makeup and traits or predilections to conditions, complex diseases. 
So for us, it's just the, the ability to consume all of that scientific evidence as it's produced by researchers around the world and then to interpret it. So it's, it's not enough to say, um, now we know the 2.6 billion points of information about your particular human genome. It's how do we make use of it? You know, if I handed that information to a doctor in its raw form, um, it's, it's garbage. There's nothing that, that you, can, you can make use of out of that. So what really has to happen is there needs to be an interpretation engine there that takes in that information and then makes um, some significant um, human readable uh, output of it. And so that's really where we're trying to uh, understand the, uh, the efficacy of, of doing this kind of research and returning these results to doctors. Um, you know, the other major challenge here for us is physicians today really are not geneticists. Right? When they went through med school, by and large, um, genetics were, was not a course of study. And so this is all new, and it's new to the people who are closest to the patients who get impacted the most directly. So there's a huge education gap here that needs to really be bridged by not only the delivery of human readable reports, but the impact by which those, those reports um, can have on the, the care that a given individual is, is receiving. Uh, I also understand you've been applying business process modeling to, your, uh, to the way your researchers work. Uh, how has that changed the, uh, their productivity and, uh, and their, uh, their output? Yeah, so we, um, when, I, when I joined the Coriel Institute about a year and a half ago, there was already a laboratory information management system in place. It was a system that was grown in-house uh, about six or eight years ago and um, was really built using the best available technologies of the day. But the unfortunate reality is um, those technologies have since been eclipsed by much more nimble, much, no, much more practical and cost-efficient uh, platforms for, for doing business process tracking. So. Um, in the past, we would uh, you know, present a lab technician with a screen, and the workflow that needed to proceed from that screen would be sort of hard-coded into an application as some monolithic portion of code. Um, now, with a, a modeling platform in place, we're able to graphically model those processes out, accounting for any differences that we might have from contract to contract or collection to collection, and make um, very quick, very nimble changes to those processes without having to go back through you know, hundreds, in some cases thousands of lines of code um, to make a minor modification to our process. So it's made us far faster at just simply uh, managing the differing needs of the business.